you guys. It's been a minute since I've seen many of y'all, and I'm so glad. Pastor Richard, so good to see you. My brother, I just thrilled when I, I saw you this morning. Last night I was sitting at Pastor Jerry's house and we were watching football and eating some barbecue. And uh, he said, let me show you the trick to why I've lost so much weight. <laughs> I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. He brings up something. He said, this is what they call chicken jerky. You've got to try this. You smell it. And I took a smell and took off a big bite. And then I said, Pastor Jerry, that's dog food. <laughs> and in fact, he had given me a dog treat. <laughs> and I wasn't even mad. I laughed so hard I wasn't even mad. I love your pastor very much. I honor he and Sister Lori. I thank God for those relationships that have that kind of depth and history. Uh, not very many folks that in our lives that have 30 plus years of history. And uh, so I thank God. He's a gift to the body, uh, not just here locally, but, but nationally. And I'm very, very grateful for all that he's added to my life. Uh, thank God for my wonderful wife, Sabrina, who's with me today. I uh, say greetings to all the folks at Eternal Life Church back in Marlow. Anybody that's watching this morning as they're carrying on without me back home. Will y'all help me preach for just a little bit this morning? Yeah. I, I'm not going to be before you very long. But I'm going to preach just a little while today on attitudes and identity. Attitudes and identity. Lord, I thank you for another opportunity to stand before your people and to present your word. I pray, Lord, that you would allow us to leave this morning changed. Don't let this just be another service, another sermon. Let us leave changed, I pray. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Daniel chapter 5, verse 11, the Bible says, There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers, inasmuch as an excellent spirit. Everybody say an excellent spirit. Excellent. Knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel inasmuch as an excellent spirit was found in this man. I'm going to give a little bit of a real brief history lesson before we get into this text too much. Many of us are familiar with this character in the Bible called Daniel. About 620 B.C., this fellow is born. And when he's 15 years of age, Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king of the Babylonian Empire, comes in and utterly destroys the city of Jerusalem and takes them captive. As he takes them captive, he handpicks the brightest and the best of the young folks. He says, I'm going to make these people serve directly under me. And it would be very typical in that day if a king were to come in to conquer like that and handpick people to work beneath him and serve him. They would make them eunuchs. For the sake of everybody here, I'm not going to try to talk about what it means to be a eunuch. Let me just say it would be an unfortunate situation for all men. He is taken from his home in Jerusalem, and he's taken to Babylon. For three years, he is indoctrinated along with the other people that were selected to be removed from Jerusalem to serve under Nebuchadnezzar. Three, the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were in that number that were taken with him. So 15 years of age, taken from his home, taken from everything he knows, indoctrinated to Babylonian culture, and forced to live in an environment where he loses his freedom, he loses his autonomy, he loses everything, taken from his family, forced to serve. It's a super unfortunate situation. He has to watch as his three dear friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are thrown into a fiery furnace, miraculously come out unscathed because of the cruel hand of Nebuchadnezzar. 
But under this ruler, Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel has the favor of God on his life. Everybody say favor. Bishop Jakes one time preached, favor ain't fair. And there is a buoyancy to favor. You know what I mean by that? When the favor of God is on your life, you can get pushed down, but you're going to pop back up. There's a buoyancy to it. We see it all through the Bible where the favor of God was on someone. And no matter where they find themselves, it doesn't take long before they start to rise. There's a buoyancy to favor. So beneath Nebuchadnezzar, the favor of God becomes evident on Daniel's life. And Nebuchadnezzar starts to lean on him to interpret dreams, and he becomes well-known for his wisdom and his insight. To where Nebuchadnezzar would often refer to him and say, uh, what, what does Daniel think about this? He rises in the ranks and becomes a trusted source. Within a few years, Nebuchadnezzar dies, and now is handed, the kingdom is handed down to Belshazzar. Once again, he's still a slave. Daniel's still a slave. He's still a servant. Are y'all still with me this morning? You doing good? I'm going to preach even though you don't know it yet. We're just laying some groundwork. So the year 540 B.C., now Daniel's a little older. He's getting to be an older man. Belshazzar takes the reins, and once again, the favor of God becomes evident on Daniel's life, and he starts to rise again. Goes from a slave to being a trusted confidant and a trusted advisor to the ruler of the strongest empire in the world at the time. Never known what it's like to live as an adult with freedom, but just keeps rising, just keeps rising. I, I already feel the Lord here this morning. I don't know if y'all feel that. I think God's going to do something here. I, I feel the Lord. So ultimately, Belshazzar decides that he is going to throw a big party, and he takes the precious, holy, consecrated items that were stolen from Jerusalem 60 years before. And he throws a crazy party and defiles those holy objects. And at this point, God says, enough is enough. And in the middle of Belshazzar's party, the finger of God comes down and writes something on the wall. I think the words are, Many, many tickle my fancy ears. <laughs> many, many tickle me farce. And I don't know. It says something like that. But he leads to, to Daniel and said, uh, I'm not sure what's written here, but it's scary. Please tell me what this says. Daniel gets the interpretation, and the interpretation is not good news for old Belshazzar. The interpretation was essentially, today you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting, and tonight your kingdom's going to be taken from you. That very night... Cyrus the Persian invades and kills Belshazzar, and we see now the Babylonian Empire shift what we call the Medo-Persian Empire, the next great world empire of five. Daniel once again now remains a slave, remains a servant as the world empire. It's so cool to me how God can bring down and raise up kings and world leaders, and it's all at his control and his command. I just want to segue for a minute and chase a rabbit. Many times it seems like the world is out of control. It's spinning its topsy turvy. I'm going to tell you, none of this has taken God by surprise. Come on, come on. He has already been in our tomorrow just like he was in our yesterday. He sits outside of the timeline. And the Bible says it is God that will raise up and establish kings and bring them down. It, God would even use a half-crazed lunatic are y'all with me? Matter of fact, the Bible says that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh to do his purpose. He will use a half-crazed man by the name of Alexander the Great. I don't have time to talk. I wish I could talk about Alexander. <laughs> so Darius the Mede, excuse me, Cyrus the Persian takes over. I know y'all wonder what does this have to do with attitude? I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So Cyrus the Mede now places Darius in charge of his kingdom. Now, once again, world leaders have changed, changed hands. And Daniel is still standing. He outlasted and outlived many world leaders, many kings. Although his entire life he's lived as a slave in servitude. 
Darius now is tricked into making a decree. Y'all probably remember this, all these Bible stories from when you were in children's church. He's tricked into a decree saying it's unlawful to worship any god but the pagan gods of Babylon. Now, the whole purpose of that decree was to get at Daniel and to ultimately take his life. Darius now finds that he is worshiping, and so he has to throw Daniel into the fiery fern, excuse me, into the lion's den. Now, growing up, I always thought that it was old little Daniel in the lion's den. Throw in little Daniel in the lion's den. Hey, little Daniel. How old do you think Daniel was when he went in the lion's den? He was 80 years of age. 80 years of age when he was thrown at the lion's den. <laughs> I can just imagine that. <laughs> Daniel, you're going to the lion's den. No more praying. He's like, all right, whatever you say. I guess I got it. I guess I'll sleep with the lions tonight. He's thrown in the lion's den. And once again, the God that he serves comes to his rest. You see, you, you could take the boy out of Jerusalem, but you couldn't take Jerusalem out of the boy. You, you couldn't touch the covenant that he had with the God that he knew so well. And here we are 65 years later, and without the reinforcement and the, the uh, reinforcement of his uh, home environment, without anybody else to say amen, without anybody else to join his Bible study group, he has stood for 65 years serving the God of Israel and his faithfulness to the God of Israel, to the one and true living God has caused him to outlast world leaders and world empires and continue to rise in the ranks because God was with him. Now, I'm about to get to a sermon now. After Daniel is delivered from the lion's den, within two years, he dies. Four years after his death, Cyrus releases all the people that had been enslaved in Babylon and allows them to return to Jerusalem. Matter of fact, he would even be instrumental in helping to facilitate and fund the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. I cannot help but to believe that his decision to do that was largely influenced by Daniel and his life. I think he had seen something in Daniel over all those years that softened his heart. So sometimes you won't know the impact your life has until after you're gone. Daniel dies, but his people are released. I said all that to get to this point. Attitude matters. The Bible said that there was found in Daniel an excellent spirit. If there was ever someone who would have been justified in being mean and bitter and ugly, it would have been this rascal. Everything had been taken from him. I don't know about you, I'd have been bitter. Y'all a bunch of self-righteous hypocrites. I'd have been bitter. Can't I get a witness from anybody? I, I, I would not have had an excellent spirit through all these leaders that continue to keep make me a slave, make me do things I didn't want to do, and come to him and say, interpret this dream. I'd have said, interpret it yourself. Leave me out of this. But the Bible said he had an excellent spirit. It was found in him. Go, go to that slide. But I want to talk about the definition of attitude. It is a settled way of thinking or feeling about someone or something, typically one that is reflected in a person's behavior. An attitude refers to a set of emotions, beliefs, and behaviors toward a particular object, person, thing, or event. So the attitude that we present in our day-to-day -day life it is a cumulative total of all the experiences we've had up to that point. Y'all tracking with me? And you might find that one particular thing is said and it triggers a bad attitude in you and you really don't even know why. But it's because it's touched some emotion from back when. It is a cumulative total of all that we've experienced to that point. That's what makes up our attitude. An attitude refers to a set of emotions, beliefs, and behaviors toward a particular 
object, person, thing, or event. Attitudes are often the result of experience or upbringing. They can have a powerful influence over behavior and affect how people act in various situations. Now, go, go to that next slide, if you will. While attitudes are enduring, this is the part I like, they also can change. Attitudes can change. Now, back, back home, I pull on people a little bit, and I, I need people to say, say amen or good preacher, you're doing okay, or way to go, Jimmy, or sit down or something. I, I, I need to engage. If, attitudes can change. Can I get a witness? Well, now we're warming up. So from the story in the life of Daniel, we learn this. God is interested in my attitude. God is interested in your attitude. Hallelujah. Next slide. This is another thing we learned from Daniel. You can take a stand without being combative. In life, you got to learn to choose your battles. I know folks that want to fight about everything. What, what, what happens when we do that, when we don't choose our battles, we fight over everything, and then we find that we have no strength for the battles that really matter. We've wasted all of our emotional fuel fighting over things and having bad attitudes about stuff that really doesn't matter, and then we find ourselves yielding on stuff that we really should fight for. Are you with me? It's possible, church, to be right and be miserable. Some people would rather be right than happy. <laughs> if you knew how right that was, you'd say amen. Some people, you can be right and miserable. You can be right and lonely. You could be right and broke. You could be right and hated. You can be right and isolated. Some people are so in love with their own opinion, they can't apologize. They can't ask, but they can't surrender anything because, here's the reason why, because they feel if they're not right, it's a direct indictment on their self-worth. They're married to their opinion, and they think that opinion defines me. And so if I'm wrong on this, it means I'm worth less. I'm preaching right whether you know it or not. What we see about Daniel and his attitude was that even though he was taken from his home, you could never make him question whose he was and who he was. That had gotten down deep on the inside of him. Even at 15 years of age, he had had such a relationship with God that he knew exactly who he was. He knew exactly who he belonged to. He knew who had his future in his hands. We, we see the same thing in the life of Joseph. Remember the coat of many colors? We see in Joseph's life that even after that coat that, that symbolized his favor with the father, after you wear the coat long enough, the coat gets down on the inside of you. And before long, they can take the coat, but they can't take the favor because it's already on the inside of you. That's what we see with Daniel. He was so convinced that the God of heaven was for him and he belonged to him that no matter what his situation, he could maintain a good attitude. God is interested in my attitude. You can take a stand without being combative. Next slide. You can disagree and still be agreeable. We live in a society where it's, everybody thinks that if you disagree with them, that you hate them. The devil is a liar. You can disagree and still be agreeable. We see it in the life of Daniel. Matter of fact, we see it so much that when he was delivered from the lion's den at 80 years of age, when they come to get him the next morning and the king is shocked to see that he's still alive and those great big old cats were curled up beside him purring, if you read the story, you'll remember that, da that Daniel's response was, Oh, king, live forever. The God of heaven has saved me, and he has shut the mouth of the lion. He wasn't mad. He wasn't bitter, and he should have been. So it puts me in with live animals like that all night long. I'm a little hot the next morning. <laughs> I guess none of y'all can relate. Y'all are better Christians than me. I'd have been a little warm about the situation. Like, you got to... An 80-year-old man getting tossed into them lions. Hey, you got a lot of nerve, Sonny. I can't believe you. But he said, oh, king, live forever. The God, your attitude matters. You can agree, uh, disagree, and still be agreeable. Help us, Lord. 
problem with us is this. When it comes to things like our attitude, when God convicts us of our attitude, has anybody ever been convicted of your attitude? Sabrina, you should, Sabrina, raise your, no, I'm just, <laughs> I, I didn't tell you that, Sometimes God convicts me about my attitude, and I know I'm wrong, but I don't want to admit it right away. It just takes a little while to, you know, finally warm up to the idea. When it comes to our attitude, when God convicts us many times, put, 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 this, put this up on the slide, we repent enough to be forgiven, but we refuse to surrender enough to be changed. We repent just enough to be forgiven but never truly surrender enough to allow God to change us. Pastor Jerry shared with me uh, what he preached was it two weeks ago when he, he dealt with attitude and how God is not always fair. God is just, but God is not always, not always fair. That was a great, great word. I'm, I told PM I'm going to preach that in my church sometime. That, that's a great, great word. So we refuse to surrender enough to allow God to truly change us. We're, we're sorry that minute. But this morning, I believe that God wants to deal with us down deep and change us. This would be a good point to amen. <laughs> Can I get a witness? <laughs> the, the church that I pastored in Norman in, in Noble, they were always about at least 30% African American. So we, we, we'd have, we knew how to have a little bit of church. And sometimes I'd say, you'd think if a brother was preaching right, someone would have the common courtesy to say, well, and people say, well. So I'm just saying, I've been raised in Pentecost. Nothing you can do will scare me. I promise that. I promise. I've seen people jump through a plate glass window and blame it on the Holy Ghost. We used to not think you'd had service until somebody called an ambulance. <laughs> people falling out. Buckets. So nothing, if you shout amen, you're not going to scare me. I promise. So I'm going to give you three quick little points, three quick points that deal with our attitude. Amen? Amen. Number one, there is a direct correlation between our attitude and our identity. When we are secure in who we are, not as many things bother us. Daniel knew who he was and he knew whose he was. And so through five to six world rulers and two world empires. He just kept a good attitude in spite of being mistreated. He just kept on keeping on because he knew who he was. Our attitude is directly affected by our identity. Number two, in dealing with attitude, we must avoid the comparison trap. That's a good point to say, man. I'm just coming down to get some water and maybe a bite of this bread if nobody minds it. <laughs> I really want to take a bite of that. Oh, it is? <laughs> we already ate dog food together. I'm, I'm not scared to drink out of you. This morning I went to the parking lot and I chased a car for a little while. I don't know, I don't know what's going on with me. <laughs> when it comes to attitude, we've got to learn to avoid the comparison trap. I think social media is crippling us in this area. Let, let me tell you all something. What, what we're comparing ourselves to, about 90% of the time, it's not even real. It's a facade. And we're comparing ourselves against something that doesn't even exist, and then we think, well, my life's terrible. Comparison is the enemy of contentment and the thief of thanksgiving. Someone ought to write that down. Preach it, Jimmy. Amen. When we, the Bible says when you compare yourselves by yourself, it's not wise. I've kind of taken a break off social media because I got so sick of every day thinking everybody else's dinner was far more superior to mine. Taking all these pictures and woo, look at it. And I'm like, our dinner sucks. I'm sorry, I probably should say stinks. I'm stinks. You get the idea. 
Everybody takes pictures with all these filters on. You think, man, the whole world's more beautiful than me. Everybody's happier than me. I wish I could take trips like everybody else in the world does. Everybody's got more money than me. Everybody's happier than me. Everybody's family's perfect except for me. I'm telling you, that's a comparison trap, and the church falls into it, and we lose control of our attitude based on something that's not even real. Comparison is the enemy of contentment. And the thief is like, how easy would it have been for Daniel to be bitter and mad and say, uh, man, I wish I was back home. Everybody else is lucky. Let me tell you something. Just go ahead and bloom right where you're planted. Go ahead and get happy right where you are on the way to where you're going. Quit waiting on everything to get perfect to have a good attitude. Woo! I haven't got Pastor Jerry's hanky or whatever that is. Oh. Snot rag. <laughs> I eat dog food. What's the matter at this point? What's the matter at this point? <laughs> got snot smeared on my face. I got dog food breath. <laughs> Everybody else is luckier than me. <laughs> Point number three. Everybody say number three. three. Dealing with attitude, things we can learn from the life of Daniel. We have to learn to let go of how it was supposed to go. In our minds, we have an idea, this is where I should be. This is where I was meant to be. And we look at where we are and we think, that's not how it was supposed to go. Has anybody ever felt that? That's not how I thought this was going to play out. I thought I'd be here by then. I wasn't supposed to lose a family member. I wasn't supposed to lose love. I wasn't supposed to lose my job. I'd done everything right. I'd paid my dues. I'd followed the rules, and now I'm here. Is anybody else honest enough to say that you've ever felt that? Daniel was punished for being bright. He was taken from his home because he was doing the right thing. He was made a slave because he was smart. You talk about unfair. We have to learn to let go of how we thought it was supposed to go. Can I, can I just continue? I got uh, f- about five minutes. Okay, I'm going really fast. Philippians chapter 4. I'm about to, I'm about to close this thing in a real hurry. I'm going to share with you the most... Uh, misunderstood verse in all the Bible, I believe. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, this is Apostle Paul, that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. That's a good amen point. By, by the way, that shows that contentment is a learned behavior. Well... I know how to be a base, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Now, here is the point. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. How many have heard that verse before? When I hear that verse, I, I, I think about Evander Holyfield when he fought Mike Tyson. He had that on his shorts. This verse has nothing to do with God giving us the ability to punch somebody hard. <laughs> It has nothing to do. <laughs> He's like, I can just hear Mike Tyson. Well, I didn't know that he was going to use scripture against me. I... <laughs> it has nothing to do. I- I've heard track people say, well, uh, thank God I ran that 100 meters so fast because I can do all things to Christ. It has nothing to do with it. Paul is talking about the ability to maintain a good attitude even when everything goes wrong. That's what he's talking about. Are you with me? He said, I have learned how to be, I've learned how to, how, how to eat prime rib, and I've also had, learned how to eat spam, and I've learned to do it both with a good attitude. I've learned to be content, not because I'm having my situation, but because I know who I am and I know who I belong to. Somebody shout yes. The Message Bible says, renders that verse this way, I'm just as happy with little as with much. With much as with little, I found the recipe for being happy, whether full or hungry, hands full or hands empty. Whatever I have, wherever I am, I can make it through anyone. I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. 
I can make it through anything because of the one who makes me who I am. In closing, number two, let me share with you why your attitude matters. Because our attitude is a major component of our witness of Jesus Christ. You can tell somebody about Jesus that you need to come and get saved, but if you're a big old ugly somebody, mean, stingy, they ain't listening. You say, you need to meet this Jesus. The same Jesus that did this for me will do it for you. They're like, well, if that's what he does for me, I want no part of it. Hard pass if he's going to make me miserable like he made you. Our attitude is a major component in our witness of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us. Uh, by the way, just incidentally, if you're at a restaurant and you tip poorly and you leave a gospel track, they ain't coming. They're not going to visit because our attitude and our behavior is a major component of our witness of Jesus Christ. Second reason why our attitude matters. Talking about attitudes and identity. Because poor attitudes will cause people to exit your life. And relationships are the currency of the kingdom. They're the currency of life. The Bible says, given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. That means this. If God's going to bless you, he's going to use a person to do it. Amen? I've never one time received a check signed Jehovah Jireh. <laughs> never. Anytime God blesses me, he uses a person to do it. And if we have ugly attitudes and we're bitter towards people, we cut people out of our life, and those could be channels that God uses to bless us. So our attitude matters because it affects our witness, and it also affects the channels that God wants to use to bless our life. Because if we hurt people and we're mean to people, people will cut you off because people don't like pain. Amen? I'm having to rush through this, but it's going to leave me something to say next time. Would you all stand with me? Today I want to pray for you that God will give all of us the revelation of who exactly we are, who we are in him, and that will affect the way we treat other people. It'll affect the way we view the world. Your identity affects your attitude. It affects everything in your life. Some people in this house, you, you play something, Brother Joe. <laughs> if you play a little something, it'll buy you like two minutes. You may have been told all your life, you're nobody, you're no good, you're stupid, and, uh, you're never going to amount to anything. Those words linger. And I know men in their 40s, 50s, 60s that still feel crippled and are emotionally underdeveloped because of they, they believe something that was said about them when they were young. And you wonder why they're mean, why they're angry, why they're bitter. It's because they, they're not sure who they are. They don't know whose they are. I'm going to tell you, you are one in a million no one else in this world has your thumbprint. No one else has your retina scan. God made you special. Nobody else in the world like you. You can make it through anything. Keep your head up. Keep a good attitude because God is on your side. You're going to come out on top. Your attitude matters. And your attitude is tied to your identity. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, in the name of Jesus. This morning, Lord, I've delivered to the best of my ability the thought that you placed on my heart. Now I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would do the rest. Lord, I pray right now that you would begin to give all of us the revelation of exactly who we are because of you. I just bind and I rebuke every spirit of inferiority, of insecurity, people that have believed a lie about their identity because of words that have been spoken over their life. I just rebuke that in Jesus' name. And I pray for healing and wholeness in our spirits and in our minds right now. Let us understand who you created us to be and how special we are. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Help us, Lord. I want to say that God's crazy about you and he loves you. Your best days and your blessed days are ahead. God's for you and he's not against you. Amen. Thank you so much for allowing me to be with you today. Pastor Jerry, thank you for allowing me this time. I love you. 
Be blessed in Jesus' name. Pastor Jerry. It's fantastic. I, I, I wish I can't. I've often said this to my family and the church. I, I can't change your attitude. You have to change it. I took notes today, you know, and it's fact, Pastor, sometimes when you don't hear me shouting, it's because I'm writing. You know, I, I do this because there's some treasures in this. And, and I can tell you, when I, this one learned to let go of how it was supposed to go. Every one of us thought, it went, you know, I thought life was going to go this way. You know, I promise you, uh, J.D., Georgia thought their game was going to go different than it went yesterday. You know, and I'm just saying, you know, we always have this idea how things ought to go. Today, there will be feelings hurt because of college football. You know, it's just the way it is. But attitude, I just, just, if you can have the right attitude, people like to be around you. They, you wonder, why, why do folk not like me? Well, he told us, your attitude stinks. Be, be, be seated just real briefly. If I get our servant leaders to come up. But man, what a word. And when I think of Daniel, an excellent spirit was found in him. I believe that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their attitude was because they'd been around. Some people you get around, they'll help your attitude. They make, it, make you better. And uh, it's one thing we've got to do. Pastor Jimmy, thank you for a good word. Amen. And to, to remind and to layer upon layer, keep our attitude right. Man, you're a good-looking bunch here. Hallelujah. I want to give you opportunity to not pay your tithe, but to give back that which the Lord has blessed you and to honor the king today. Of course, we're going to bless Pastor Jimmy. When I travel and preach, you know, most of you know I was out for the month of August. Uh, I was blown away how the church has treated me as far as the kindness that reciprocated. You know, 30 years I've been pastoring, 40 years I've been preaching, so I know a little bit. But I promised God years ago I would never let a man or woman minister in this house that we didn't take care of. And I hold to that promise. If it comes out of my own pocket, I hold to that promise. I've brought, I've brought checks back into preachers and given it back to them because of the scandal that I saw in churches and said, I don't want your money. I'll preach to your people, but I don't want your money. And walked away. And I remember one time my daughter had pneumonia. Mandy was a little girl and had pneumonia. And it, I could have used it, but I thought, no, nah, you, you tried to sucker punch these people. You tried to get them to give me an offering, and then you kept over half of it. We're not doing that here. Amen. So if you have an opportunity to give, it's on an envelope. If you have something special you want to write on there, just put, you can put missions or evangelists or just a little bit something different than your tithe. And we'll make sure we bless Pastor Jimmy with it. As we give today, we're believing God for more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor. Amen. Amen. I'm going to give the announcements today since I didn't have a lot to do. And I, I, I guess, Pastor Jimmy, I wish you hadn't told the story about the dog food. <laughs> the last time Pastor Jimmy was here, he talked about eating dog food as an evangelist. It was a can. It didn't have the right wrap on it. His mother opened it up, and they fed the whole... You remember that? They fed the whole family, uh, and uh, they were so poor traveling, they didn't know what it was. Be careful about unlabeled cans. And uh, so it was peaches, it, your dogs. It was the poodles, peaches, dog food. So just wanted to say I'm, I'm sorry. I don't nobody wants to come eat at my house now. Real quick, guys, you know, the pantries are going to be open today out at the other ranch. And, uh, little Debbie here, did I see little Debbie?